Hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to um, welcome uh, Julie, Christy, and Chris to this event. And I want to thank Northeastern University for the fantastic Plan Shift Initiative and uh, for holding these talks, um, which I think are uh, really useful and enlightening, especially for students and alumni as well. And uh, it is a great pleasure for me to have my dear friends, uh, Julie, Christy, and Chris. Uh, let me start by saying um, Julie uh, is one of the greatest innovators uh, in multiple ways, and whom I admire uh, because of the businesses she, she's put together, but also because uh, there is always a very strong ethical standpoint that she makes in everything she does. And, and, there's, uh, and there's a line of, of thought that I really respect. Uh, everything she does is innovation, not only on the technical or, or at the food level, but also uh, it has great impact socially and from the environmental standpoint. Um, Christy Lagalli, uh, I've known her for years. And what might be very interesting to uh, everyone attending the event today is that she's a mechanical engineer. And we're going to ask her how and why that has a role in what she does in uh, food innovation. And uh, last but not least, my dear friend Chris, uh, I need to make the premise. He's the one who mentored me and, and made me do whatever I do now. So thank you, Chris. And, uh, and so you hold the responsibility as well. <laughs> but uh, Chris is, um, let's say, you know, the true pioneer of investment and innovation in plant-based and in replacing animals. We all owe him a great debt of gratitude uh, because of he traced the path for this. He taught everyone how to make businesses out of ideas, and he made them successful at every level. And uh, and so I can't wait to ask him how it's going with his with his uh, most recent projects. But we thought that it would be a good idea to give each one of the participants a few minutes to introduce themselves. And we'll start with Julie, if that's OK. Great, great. Well, thank you Zeva, so much. We're so excited about your Plant Shift initiative. And it's wonderful to be here today talking about um, innovation and entrepreneurship and um, and Northeastern, of course, is the perfect place for that because it's, it's such an innovative model. And I'm um, so thrilled to be here talking to students in the broader community um, about the work that we've been trying to do at our restaurants, Planet Burger. And I'm just going to share a few slides to um, talk with you about um, some of our ideas and how we um, are working to make um, planet friendly food accessible for everybody. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay, sorry about that. Wait a minute. I'm still this many months into Zoom. I'm still being challenged sometimes. I, I, is my screen up there yet? Let's see. Yes. Is the screen there. Okay, great. Hold on a second. Great. Um, so at Planet Burger, this is a, a restaurant um, that we launched um, just before the pandemic, actually, September 2019. And um, at Planet Burger, we try to be intentional about everything we do. And um, so we have a logo, you'll see that's our Planet Burger logo there. And it's uh, crafted to look like both um, the earth and a burger, if you can see that <laughs> with a little creativity. Um, Julie, we're seeing a chopped version of your page, so you may want to reset that uh, or or go to the smaller view. Hold on, I'm not sure how to do that. If you do this, if you uh, stop doing the presentation, I'll go back to the regular view, and that way we can see it. Okay, can you see it now? Nope. No, all right, hold on. So do a share screen. Hold on. Is that better? There you go. Perfect. Okay. Yep. Good, good, good. good. Um, okay. And so, uh, you know, Gandhi is, is supposedly the person who said, be the change you wish to see in the world. And so with Planet Burger, we say, eat the change you wish to see in the world, because it's a simple thing that anybody can do. And one of the things that Seba said 
in um, the first part, the, the last series, or I guess the kickoff of this series was, you know, an individual can change the world and we can do it one burger at a time, but we also, I'll talk a little bit about doing it more broadly. Hold on. Now, hold on, now I'm having problems going on my screen. There we go. Um, I'm just gonna really quickly run through our core values um, because our number one core value, when you think about um, plant-based food and or planet-based food is if you don't bring people joy, they're not gonna eat it. And so that's one of our core values. That's our number one core value. Our second is to act with intention. And again, this gets back to what Seba said, each individual can make, um, can make change. And so, make the choices. We actually uh, quote Rosa Parks here for this um, core value. And we, we do think of ourselves as activists um, and thinking about whether it around about justice, and health for the planet, health for people and health for communities. We also um, have the core value of connecting to the source. And we quote Ethan Brown, who's the founder of Beyond Meat. And we serve the Beyond Meat burger at our restaurants. And he says, who says meat has to come from animals. And related to that, just wanted to talk, whoops, sorry. So if that's going, sorry about that, it's not. A little bit about, wait, it's jumping, sorry. About um, our, our environmental impact. And so what we have here is, um, as I said, we serve Beyond Meat Burgers. And so we talk about the environmental impact and whether you're talking about water, land use, or greenhouse gas emissions, you can see the difference between um, the Beyond Meat Burger, which we sell at Planet Burger, and the Beef Burger, and it's considerably less. And so when we think about that, every single hamburger makes a difference. I'm sorry. Um, creating positive change together. Again, it's with every burger, but then we also look through our grants program. Um, we've created something called Eat the Change Impact. And so, Again, we're looking at individual and every burger that we that, that people eat making a difference, but then we also look at how can we more broadly make a difference in the community. So we launched a grants program last year and this summer we'll make our second round of grants. It's a competitive process we put out an RFP and we're looking for groups that are kind of can address the concept of eating with intention, fact-based science, democratizing plant-friendly diets, as well as innovation. And so just a few of our grantees in that area are these groups here. Um, and we fund everything from kind of individual behaviors. So like uh, by any grants necessary in the far right corner, a woman named Tracy McCorder launched a campaign last year called 10,000 Vegan Black Women. And she actually got 15,000 to sign on um, to take the pledge to at least go for a month as vegans and to ideally stay that way. Um, though I'm sure not all did. And, but we also fund things like policy change through groups like DC Greens, um, which works on food policy issues in Washington, DC and making um, healthy food, more fruits, more vegetables available and affordable and accessible in low income communities. Our, um, our mission statement, which I just popped over, really embodies all of our, um, our core values, which is, again, if the food isn't delicious, people aren't going to eat it. And so that's what we really try to do. And in addition to the grants, we also do um, friend raisers. We, we get involved in all the communities. We now have eight restaurants. Um, we launched six of them during the pandemic um, or during the height of the pandemic. And we just launched another one about two weeks ago. And so we try to get involved in the communities that we serve to bring in all sorts of people to raise money for local nonprofits and to spread the word about planet-friendly food. That's just a picture. These are some pictures of our food. You can see it's all delicious. We got Beyond products. We also have a chicken product that's made from the fruiting body of an oyster mushroom. And, um, get our community involved again through our social media. This was early on. We now luckily have more than 2000 followers. We're up to more than 18,000 and still working on it. And again, having people who are fully plant-based as well as not being involved in this and making choices um, for plant-based eating. Just a few pictures and enjoy, and that's it. Thank you, Julie, and fantastic. And hopefully your grant program can overlap with the Plan Shift Initiative. Who knows, we'll figure out a way to- Absolutely. Get a synergy there. And uh, Christy, it's now my pleasure to ask you to uh, briefly introduce yourself and, and your work, if you don't mind. 
Sure. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Christy Legali. I'm the founder and CEO of Rebellious Foods. Um, Rebellious Foods is a production and production technology company working to make plant-based meat available, affordable, and, um, and cost-effective for everyone to, to basically have access to. Um, because we're talking to engineers today, I thought I would share a little bit more about our company from the engineering perspective. We actually run a three-tier company where we um, design products and design them for both um, private companies like fast food restaurants, but also public um, sell, sell products right off the shelf. Those are our rebellious patties, nuggets, and tenders. Um, that's one part of our company. The second is that we actually run our own production facility, which is why I'm in a pretty active area right now. And then last but not least, um, we run a comprehensive research and development laboratory that is developing the next generation of plant-based meat production equipment. So I'm gonna share my screen really, really briefly and show you just a little bit about that. Um, All right, is that showing up as a full screen? All right, so at Rebellious Foods, we're developing a novel production stack for plant-based meat production. And this happens to be our Rebellious, our new Rebellious Nugget. Um, we also have Rebellious Patties and Tenders on our, on our um, website. Essentially, manufacturing technology is what makes um, meat cheap and readily available. If you've ever been in a chicken processing facility all the way back to the um, mid 1950s, early 1960s, um, automation and mechanization is what makes cheap meat so cheap and readily available. Yet we really don't have this level of industrialization in the animal or party plant based meat industry, or at least not to this extraordinary degree. And so that's what we're working on at Rebellious. Um, right now, a lot of plant-based meat, not all of it, but some of it is made via bowl choppers, mixers, tumblers. In the case of people who make bread battered fried um, chicken, plant-based chicken products, they use continuous fryers like this one and one we have here in our facility. Um, these are all fine tools, but um, they aren't as effective as they could be. Um, this is actually our team working in a refrigerated facility in a, with a very small bowl chopper. And we found a lot of problems when we started using it, using this type of tool. And we realized uh, pretty early on and founded the company around the idea that we could make plant-based meat faster, better, and cheaper if we really understood the fundamental problems with making plant-based meat. And really quick, the fundamental problem with making plant-based meat is that um, at least the type that we make, which is called mix and form plant-based meat production, is that we're essentially using meat processing tools that were designed for the deconstruction of animal carcasses, such as shown on the left, where you've got chicken and you remove the feathers and you've got a carcass and you remove the bones and then you turn it into a deconstructed process or deconstructed dough that gets turned into chicken nuggets. This is all a subtractive manufacturing process for those of you really into manufacturing. Um, you're probably very familiar with the difference between that and additive manufacturing. So bread making, plant-based meat production, um, a lot of different actually cooking processes are actually additive manufacturing. So on the right hand side, what you see here is that all the ingredients that go into plant-based meat need to be carefully brought together, emulsified, sheared, mixed in just the right way under just the right conditions, under just the right temperatures and brought together very carefully to make a product that's very similar. A lot of the manufacturing issues, not all, but a lot that we see in the plant-based foods world or the plant-based meat world is the result of the fact that we're using off-the-shelf meat processing equipment that is made for subtractive manufacturing and trying to use it for additive manufacturing. So really, really quickly, what we do at Rebellious Foods in the equipment research and development division of our company, which is about a third of our company, we um, do prototyping, testing, mixing, forming, all sorts of different methodologies. And we actually build tools and prototypes. This is Julia and Chloe, who's some two of our um, builders in the um, equipment research and development lab. This is the, the whole team working with a professor at a university. Um, and then we, de we develop, um, design, prototype, test and deploy new production equipment that automates the production of plant-based meat in order to bring the cost down, the volumes up, and the quality consistently high so consumers can ultimately be able to afford high volumes of plant-based meat as part of their diet. That's what we do at Rebellious, thanks. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Christy. That's amazing. And uh, well, I'll get back to you and lots of questions after that. And um, Chris, if you don't mind uh, introducing yourself, you, you've done so many things. It would probably take 10 hours just to do a brief presentation. But if you can try and yeah. summarize it, that would be great. Well, first I'll say, um, you know, thank you for the introduction. I, I'm not deserving of a lot of the credit that I get under the premise that even a broken clock is right twice a day. Um, I've just been standing in a spot for a really long time, uh, trying to get others to pay attention. I was put in that spot by uh, an enlightened woman named Kirsty Golson, who, who I went on to marry. But basically, um, I needed to look at the world through her eyes because because it was a different way of looking at the world and how we how we've been kind of manipulated um, around needing meat for food and animals and our in our in our focus just to be clear is around reducing the suffering of animals so that's that's our charge. Um, I'm an engineer's worst nightmare. I'm undisciplined. I don't play by the rules. Why? Because I've never read the rule book. Um, engineers compliment me very well. I, I create challenges and then they tell me why I can't do certain things. Um, and somewhere in the world, we find harmony uh, between that by challenging the system. And effectively, that's what we've been doing. But at the basis of everything that I've done over these years, helping companies to come to market was an exercise on studying human behavior of one individual. And that individual was me. I had aspirations to stop eating animals. I changed my view on how they should serve their purpose in this world and it wasn't to feed me. Um, and that aspiration was not met by my actions, which were going in a very different direction. So the idea was how can we change this idea around um, how we make decisions around food, which are fleeting. Uh, they're, they're spontaneous, they're in the moment, they're traditional. How can we change our aspirations and how can we change our actions to meet those, those, those aspirations? And how do you do it? You do it by getting engineers to <laughs> help you um, put food into your pie hole that keeps you satisfied. And the, the simple answer is what we're trying to do is create really good eating experiences that don't involve a whole lot of uh, deep thinking or long-term commitment. It's about how do we get through a meal? And the idea was, well, if you can make food fit into the paradigm of how we make food decisions, then chances are people will eat it if it's better for them, better for the environment and so forth. So we developed something called the Food Pact, price awareness, convenience, and taste. Those are the four key drivers of how we make food decisions. And every company in our portfolio, we have about 60 of them, uh, focus on these four key drivers and what we can do to make it easier for humans to make it easier to make the right decision about how to be a better steward to this world. And with that, luckily came really good comfort food. I'm originally from Philadelphia and, and this is true. I used to eat about three cheese steaks a day, or not a day, a week. And, and it was just, I was a comfort food junkie and that hasn't changed one bit. So I love the taste of meat, but I don't like the eating animals. And so the idea was, how can we take scientists, culinary artists, um, innovators, engineers, supply chain experts, nutrition experts, put them all together and come out with something that, that makes me happy until I get to the next meal. And effectively, that's what we've been doing for the last uh, 14 years in this space. And it's been a fun drive. And along the way, I got to meet uh, the people on this panel and many, many more. So. Um, I could go on for an hour, but I'm not going to. Sebastiano, want you? But, but I'd love to. I'd love to at, at least mention good catch because you're going to go back to that. Sounds good. Yeah. So on occasion, when we can't find a company to invest in, we'll start one from scratch because, well, if you're from Northeastern, then you're familiar with with Babson College, and that's, I went to Babson and. Babson is basically a bunch of juvenile delinquents that weren't disciplined enough to get into Harvard or, or Northeastern or anywhere else. Uh, so we were shoved into this, this finishing school for entrepreneurs. And so we are really fearless around doing startups. And um, on occasion, we'll do a startup and Gathered Foods and Good Catch was one that's saying, well, look, we've got Beyond Meat. We've got some chicken coming out. We've got other products that have been around for a long time, but nobody's focusing on seafood. Uh, we eat between 200 and 300 different types of seafood. 40% uh, of the global population relies on seafood in some form as a core protein for them. Um, and yet nobody was really addressing it. What could we do? And so effectively, we took um, culinary artists, chefs, combined them with food scientists and came up with good catch tuna fish and burgers and a bunch of other stuff. So. Wonderful. Thank you, Chris. And just as, as, a, as a general uh, statement, uh, because we're here talking about innovation in, in plant-based and in alternative to animals, 
um, we're not a bunch of crazy people. The point is there's, uh, there's a very urgent need for this because of the waste of resources and, and disastrous um, environmental consequences producing food with animals has. So it is, it is a natural task for intelligent people and for people with technical knowledge and, and any talent and new ideas to um, come to the task. Uh, the, the truth is not only uh, producing food through animals is a disaster for the planet and for humanity and for the animals also, but it is um, totally unsustainable and not, no later than 2030 it will be impossible to produce all the food that's produced through animals the same way uh, for many reasons, including uh, the most important, which is total, uh, you know, a, a gigantic gap in freshwater availability. So, uh, you know, think of what uh, Julie is doing with Planet Burger. Uh, if you, um, you know, feed a cow to produce meat, you will get one calorie out of 100 that you feed this cow. And that, that is a waste we cannot afford anymore as a planet. And uh, so, Julie, when I, when I was listening to you, I, I, I thought again of how uh, in your work, you always overlap different uh, levels, uh, you know, the social level and, and the educational level and the nutritional level. And we got a question, by the way, in the meanwhile, about the, the calorie count of your food versus animal food. So if you don't mind addressing, you know, your very successful way of creating synergies between different level of activism, if you want, but also touching on a nutritional side. Yeah, well, let me talk about the nutritional side first. Um, um, there's a plant-based initiative fund that's been created recently at the Stanford University Medical School to look at um, essentially plant-based food and, and is in this case, there's a study recently done specifically around the Beyond Meat Burger and a beef burger and, and to look at it. And so already, you know, we know that Beyond Meat doesn't have um, cholesterol, has less saturated fat, um, less fat. Um, it's about the same calorie profile, although they just came out with 3.0 burger. And so, but again, the, what they're working on is getting it healthier and healthier each time, but still tasting delicious because you need people to buy it. Um, so that they'll make this, this choice. Um, but over an eight week period, when they did a study um, where there were a group that ate animal-based meat and plant-based Beyond Burgers, when they looked at um, cholesterol, including LDL, heart disease risk factors, body weight, um, they found improvement in key metrics on all of those. And so it's healthier that, you know, the, and so it's wonderful to have data just as University of Michigan did the, 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 the study where we were able to talk about the, um, the footprint of um, a Beyond Meat Burger versus a Beef Burger. And so, um, so on those two levels, you know, it's, it's doing well, but the burger is, it's not, um, it's not steamed broccoli. It's, it's, it's a delicious burger. And, and, um, and if you don't make delicious burgers, um, people aren't going to, you know, aren't going to buy them and aren't going to make the choice to choose plant-based food, which is both more healthy for the individual, even if it's a Beyond Burger, which is better for you, but still not as, you know, it's still not steamed broccoli. Right. Um, but so we know that on the environmental and health fat levels, it's very, very important. And democratizing plant-based food is also really important. And you know, Christy spoke to this. You know, you've got to make it affordable and accessible for everybody. And um, and you know, the, the plant-based industry doesn't have the scale yet, doesn't have the the government helping it. Um, but we also know that um, in fairly short order, our, the plant-based alternatives are going to be less expensive than meat um, as, as our technology scale. And, and so they will become more and more um, affordable. Someone was just telling us they saw Beyond Burger Pack sold at Costco or something at some incredibly low price. And so we're already working very hard to bring the prices down. And then we're concurrently doing work through, um, through our Eat the Change Impact Grants. Um, you know, but the price point is critical, right? And where these where these products are is also critical because it doesn't matter, you know, if, if they're not accessible and affordable, um, they're not going to be purchased. And I, for 12 years, worked at a health foundation that had a focus specifically and making 
healthy food accessible and affordable low income communities. And so part, we're trying to get at that not only through, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not an employee of Beyond Meat, so I'm not speaking on behalf of Beyond Meat at all. Um, but I mean, certainly a goal of Beyond Meat is, 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 is to, to be everywhere and, and to be accessible. But for Eat the Change, our impact grants, we are working to um, support nonprofits across the country at the national level, as well as at the community level to raise awareness around plant-based food and the impact on health as well as the community. And our, the, the, our partners who, who received grants last year, they really come at it from a variety of different perspectives and they know their communities best and what's gonna be most compelling to their communities. And so we defer, you know, defer to them. And we also want, um, we want to keep it positive. We don't want it to be any shaming. We actually look at the social media of a lot of our grantees before they become grantees to see if it is something positive and not going after people for eating meat. We know that the number of people who are going to become vegans is going to be a very small proportion, but what we want to do is increase access to plant-based foods for everybody and the information. Wonderful, thank you. And let, let's just remind everyone that also th there still is a price difference between plant-based and animal-based, but it's mostly because the meat and dairy industry are the biggest recipients of public subsidies, taxpayers' money of any industry. Uh, probably bar the oil industry, but that's that's going down anyway. And both in Europe and the US, it, it's absolutely disproportionate. So if today those subsidies, which make no sense, were to go, uh, meat, animal meat would be probably five times as expensive as plant-based meat already. So it is an artificial, artificially, um, you know, uh, doctor market that we're facing. But uh, Christy, I, I want to turn to you and ask you, I'm particularly intrigued by what role your, uh, your background as an engineer, you work for Boeing, right? So I did. Um, what, what role did that play in your uh, path to uh, developing your own food innovations? And, uh, and how important is that? And, and especially, uh, would you advise uh, young engineers and, and, and young people to follow your path and, and using their technological skills to uh, go into the food sector? Yeah, I definitely would um, advise uh, engineers to go into the food sector for a variety of reasons. And it actually kind of gets back to what you just said about subsidies in, in the food industry. Um, being that we have very much favored meat, dairy, and eggs from an, from a government perspective, we have to remember that a lot of those um, a lot of those subsidies also have a historical effect. Meaning, if subsidies were used over the last seventy years for the um, establishment of large volume facilities, slaughterhouses, you know, institutional um, or pardon me, in, uh, industrial level distribution systems, things like that. All of those are ways in which um, we have used public money in order to create infrastructure. And infrastructure is really what's missing in the plant-based foods industry. Um, we literally can't build enough factories right now for making plant-based meat. And that's why so it, we need so many more engineers in the plant-based foods world. We need more and more engineers working on processing equipment, facilities, process of plant-based meat, supply chain, even the software um, to make plant-based meat production and the entire system work even better. Um, there are just so many really exciting opportunities for engineers to go into this space. And the, 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 the opportunity is extraordinary. So a lot of people don't realize that in the United States, you know, because of a long history of infrastructure, a long history of subsidization, um, we create, or, or the meat industry produces over 108 billion pounds of animal meat in the US alone. And yet plant-based meat only clocks in at about a half a billion pounds. So not a half, a, sorry, half a billion or about 500 million pounds, probably more than that at this point but it ends up being just a fraction of a fraction of a percent of the volume of animal-based meat. 
So we really have a historical um, effort to overcome from an industrial perspective in making more plant-based meat, meaning we need to create the equipment, we need to create this, uh, the facilities. And as a result, engineers are always going to have an extraordinary role in the production and um, establishment of the plant-based meat industry to be a volume producer that can truly replace animal-based meat on a large scale. Wonderful. And, and I'm sorry, and back to, to the other question of, oh, yes. of uh, your personal path. Yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I uh, am a former aerospace engineer. I worked at ATK Space Systems prior to working at Boeing Commercial Airplanes. Um, I worked on a variety of systems, but I probably spent the most time developing new tools for building airplanes. So I was doing tooling manufacturing. So for those of you in the engineering uh, school, you probably know that we build tools, we, we build widgets, we make things, we make interesting things, but then we also build tools in order to make those things. So that's manufacturing engineering, and it's, it's a lot of mechanical engineering, it's a lot of process engineering, a lot of industrial engineering, a lot of human factors engineering that goes into um, both tooling to make other products like plant-based meat, as well as the automation that goes along with those pieces of equipment. So for example, right here in our facility at Rebellious Foods, we have automated bread, batter, and fry lines. Um, all of those pieces of equipment are, are actually the same in the animal-based meat industry, um, but there's certain tweaks that we make to them just to make sure that we can control the, the way it's operating or control the food safety issues around it. All of those are really important things that um, every type of engineer can get involved in when it comes to really building the infrastructure of the plant-based meat industry. So regardless of your background, um, there is an enormous opportunity to make an impact on for humans, animals, the cl climate um, by making essentially, as we say it, rebellious, which is so similar to what Julie says at her company, we always say to people, build the change you want to see in the world. And as engineers, that is what we do. It's actually one of our core values. And when people do really great things, we say we're so grateful they are building the change they want to see in the world because we're all about infrastructure and capacity at Rebellious and, and how we make what we have more and more effective every single day. So that's where I see um, my past experience as a manufacturing engineer, as a tool designer, um, is, is really impactful for, for essentially starting a company like this and then getting to work with other fantastic engineers who are now on board. So engineering is our largest department here at Rebellious Foods. Mm -hmm. And, and you are hiring people too, right? At the moment, we are hiring people. We, if we had enough people, we could grow by twenty-five, almost thirty-five percent by tomorrow. <laughs> um, nice. There's not enough people. So, and yes, we are hiring facilities people, engineers, cost accountants, whatever you do out there. We probably have a job for you. And see, I, I remember uh, your enthusiasm, and and it was exactly the same when you were starting and thinking of doing all that you've done, and and now it's reality. And by the way, this gives me also a, a chance to touch for one second on uh, the eternal uh, question of you know, there's a PR campaign, a negative PR campaign planted about. Uh, uh, it, again, pun intended, planted about plant-based food that says it's hyper-processed. Um, maybe it would be worth one minute, Christy, if you can explain what goes into an animal chicken nugget and what goes into a plant-based chicken nugget just to show the difference. Yeah, well, I mean, in a lot of ways, they're not that different. I mean, processed chicken products are processed chicken products and plant-based meat products are processed foods as well. Um, we don't necessarily deny that, but if you're going to be eating chicken nuggets, like the vast majority of the United States does, um, in the United States, we produce over you know, 40 or 50 billion pounds of chicken every single year, and about half of them are considered what's, what's called further processed, meaning they're made into chicken nuggets, patties, and tenders, meaning people are going to eat these products whether we like it or not. It's that they're going to be made out of animals. Um, so if you're going to be eating chicken products, you might as well eat something better for you. It's, it may also be a processed product, but it is also a better for you processed product. As Julie said, no cholesterol. In the case of chicken, the main benefit for people who are looking for a health impact is the fact that it's, there's no antibiotics in it. And it's not grown with antibiotics because they were never chickens in the first place. So, um, 
there's a real benefit to it. We're not def necessarily saying to the world, you should eat this instead of apples and oranges and broccoli. We're saying you should eat this instead of the chicken nuggets you have at the stadium, at the ballpark, at the school cafeteria. And we also have to remember that meat products, specifically processed meat products, um, if we can find better versions of them, that uh, it was my, I'm sorry, I just tripped over myself. Processed meat products were made for a reason. They offer convenience to the school lunch program. They offer people fun foods to eat on a Tuesday night meal. If we can offer those in plant-based versions, they're genuinely better for people, better for the planet, better for the environment. Um, but you know, they are still processed products. They're just better for you processed products. Well, I, I was I was trying to get you to say what goes inside animal nuggets, but you're being politically correct. I you know oh. I can I can I can mention that they're mostly made of you know of, of the most horrible parts of the cadavers of the animals <laughs> that no one would ever eat otherwise, and they're processed and treated and decolored, deflavored, and then recolored and reflavored to. Uh, look like chicken, which they're which they're basically not. But anyway, some of uh, them are. Some of them are. Not all of them are. You know, there's always that one company that makes it out of whole muscle chicken breasts and things like that. Um, so you know, but it's still a processed food, and um, it's still made out of an animal. It still has antibiotics, and so still corpses, kind of focus but, on the thing. You know, that that to me makes a difference. <laughs> and 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 Chris. Um, always on, on the subject of how uh, technology is fundamental, I, I think you, you just uh, finished building a phenomenal production plant for good catch. And can you tell us what products you do and, and, and tell us about this, this fantastic factory and the technology that, that is there? Yeah, so um, what's important to know is that there's, there's two different sides. Actually, it's the same thing in, in all animal agriculture. You've got, let's break up the seafood industry. You've got the fishing industry, which is gathering proteins. That's just fish. And there's lots of ways. If you've seen Seaspiracy, which I encourage you to watch, you'll see all the misery that's kind of built into that. You can't really separate the two. Once you've got the protein, from there onward, it's, it's now culinary, right? So you're turning that into something that we eat. We don't take a bite of a tuna fish right out of its gut, right? You know, we, we turn it into something. So in the way our factory is designed, we've got the protein production side. What's the base protein? So it's a platform. Then the question is, well, what do we do on the culinary art side? What are we blending it with? What's the spices? Everything that kind of comes with this to turn it into this finished product. In our case, you know, we're making tuna fish. You're, you got your, this bake, base protein is made out of six legumes, um, really good protein content. Uh, the more kind of ingredients that you use to create these building blocks, uh, you can put things in there that'll make it uh, more better gelling, better in a hydrated environment, like a soup or a salad, um, better, uh, easier for you to digest, right? And I think it's important for your listeners to know, plant-based is on a continuum. You know, we've got everything from a portobello mushroom burger, which in my world is a pretty high disappointment quotient to, you know, the more meaty side, which is for me, what I like. Kirsty wants the quinoa burger. I want, you know, the Beyond Burger, right? So we get to live throughout that entire cycle. So anybody who says, well, it's too processed, they're probably the same people that are ordering, you know, pizza at night. You know, the, the fact is we all have, we don't eat the same thing over and over again. When you look at how we built our factory in good catch, the idea is here's our base protein. Now, what are we going to turn it into that people actually want to eat? So we make everything from tuna flakes to crab cakes, white fish burgers. Uh, we just came out with fish sticks, breaded and non. I can bread my finger and you'd eat it. So there's lots of good things that you can do with breading to make it a really good consumer experience. At the end of all of this, guys, it's a simple. Did I enjoy my lunch or not? And am I going to do it again? So the taste has to be there. It has to be a delightful experience that you come back for. The only thing that will allow you to downgrade taste is hunger. If you're really, really hungry, you're going to probably kind of eat anything. But the, but the more you're not hungry and the more that that experience has to be good, the higher that level needs to be. The other thing that we focus on is mouthfeel. Taste is something that you can mess with later and the meat industry does it as well. You put ketchup and you put soy sauce and you put A1 steak sauce, which is vegan, on top of all sorts of things to make them palatable. In our world, we use the culinary arts to finish that process, to make sure that the final experience is really, really good. So we start with the R&D lab. We scale that into our factory. And the factory then has to then take that base protein, manipulate it into something that is in its finished form. And then we got to get it out through the distribution channels. In that, you got taste, price, which is scaling, awareness. Does anybody even know this exists? And then, of course, convenience. Is it available to me locally? If I have to drive 
four hours to get a Beyond Burger. I'm not eating it. So all of those things have to be met just to get that last 12 inches into my mouth. We can't ignore any of those things. And so our job as investors is to make sure that all the right people are in place to take a system that's taken really about 150 years to build and make sure that we're fitting inside that system. And our factory fits at kind of the beginning side of that. Did that answer your question, Sebastian? Yeah, absolutely. But but again, you know, underlying the, the very important role that technology has in all of this, in all the innovation, and the fact that only by pursuing and achieving great technology, you can have decent prices and you can have great products. And so once again, the more engineers, the better, as, as we're all saying. And, and I think if I could add, um, the dining experience does not end with what went down your throat. Like, can you digest it? Did you get something of nutrient value out of it? I have a tough time processing Impossible Burgers, but I can eat a lot of Beyond Burgers. And some people, it's the other way around. So not everybody is built to eat everything. And this idea that taste is the only thing that matters, you need to think about the entire, entire experience. So we, we do look at that. And for anybody who thinks that the plant-based world is only focusing on one or two things, uh, we're not. We're looking at the entire food system, trying to mess with it, trying to make it better. And you can't do it by just coming up with a slightly better tasting burger. Uh, it's more complex than that. Yeah, and, and, and again, you know, it's a, it's a technological task, but the, there are now uh, this research and development into every possible product because you need to replace them all. Uh, as, as we were saying before, and as Jerry was saying, uh, the, the world is not going to turn vegan, but uh, a lot of products that people are used to eat can come from better sources and, and not involve uh, environmental destruction and killing animals. So we should pursue uh, those, those options. And um, uh, there's, there's a question that came in earlier for you, Julie. Are you as Planet Burger, Planet Burger plan, planning to uh, open restaurants in campuses or near campuses around the US? And is, is that part of the plan? Well, that's a good question. Yeah, we're, we're starting to, so we, we launched our first eight restaurants are all in Whole Foods markets, but we are definitely looking to um, get outside of Whole Foods. We, they have been an amazing partner um, and but we are looking to get outside Whole Foods and we're going to be launching one of our first um, this summer in DC in Georgetown, which will be not on the Georgetown University campus, but actually close to GW and Georgetown and a bunch of other places. Um, <clears throat> but we know colleges would be great locations. And so we have started looking at some places in Boston. I don't think there's any city in the country that has more colleges um, concentrated than the Boston area. And so looking at some places where we can actually have our brand on the street um, and accessible to college students and anybody else in the community who's interested. And um, so, yes, we're, we're, we're looking at it, but um, haven't signed any leases yet. <laughs> okay, well, we, we hope you will soon. So um, here's a question from a fellow uh, plant-based producer, uh, Kaylee from Renegade Foods, who uh, is asking, and I think Christy, maybe you can answer this, or Chris, um, what is your advice for someone who wants and needs to scale? production who wants to go first? Right, try to get enough sleep at night <laughs> <laughs> um well for us scaling you know has to do with efficiency um first and foremost it, it, the ability to plan well and to um make sure that your rois are in really good shape um, you know, some companies, including our own, um, do end up having to go to contract manufacturers. And um, with respect to our making our products at contract manufacturers who then make our products and then kind of sell it back to us, so to speak. Um, one of the major things to do is just make sure that you have really, really stable production so that when it's made by someone else, they have a foolproof way of making it and you don't have a situation where product is going out to the world and it's not a good product. So I would say, you know, that's kind of your first step is make sure your process is incredibly stable and, and it's, it's repeatable at a contract manufacturer as a first step of scaling. Another step for scaling for us is deploying our new production equipment, um, using the same facility to make twice or as three times as much. And um, that's, that's a really important um, ethos of our company is to show that 
we can make plant-based meat a lot less expensively by doing it more efficiently with the right tools. So um, I'm sure Chris has a lot more experience with this. I'll let it go to him. I mean, uh, the fact is, it's a, it's a, it, you're on a continuum when it comes to scaling even. So you can have a pilot plant. We always like pilot plants actually, because pilot production allows you to tweak a product. Um, don't think that your product is gonna come out perfect. Uh, it never does. And I remind people that Beyond Meat was a, was a chicken company for eight years before the Beyond Burger came out. Uh, we're all in, the, in this world of perpetual R&D if we wanna be really, really good, which means you're always scaling. Uh, so try to develop a system that allows you to scale through a gating process. And it doesn't have to be, you know, big enough production to serve the world. Uh, you can start by serving a region and, and growing uh, within that. And so figure out your limitations, use muscle when you have to, but don't plan on using muscle to scale. Uh, you know, sometimes you fake it till you make it and that's, that can be okay. Uh, but at the same time, you want to, you want to be planning ahead of the curve and, and create more time because it takes longer to scale than you think that it will. Uh, scaling a product can fail rather rapidly at scale. You can make a phenomenal product in your kitchen. We do it every day. Try to make that a thousand times over and it gets harder and try to take, make it a million times over and, it, and, it, and it's a new product altogether. Uh, so take your time with it um, and try to get onto a gating process that keeps it in check. Wonderful. Katie, I hope that, that answered your question. And um, here's another question that I would turn to Julie. Um, uh, someone asked, would plant-based food require more imported herbs and spices with current COVID-19 situation, therefore make the industry more vulnerable in, in a similar situation? Would a meat industry claim that doing it uh, locally offers us food security? I think the answer that's been answered by what's, what's happened during COVID in the meat industry. But Julie, if you want to address that. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> We didn't, you know, during, during the pandemic, we haven't had any supply chain issues um, in terms of herbs or spices or things coming from around the world. Um, you know, there are definitely people on the team who work with those, those things more, more closely than I, but it really hasn't been an issue. And, um, you know, again, our, our main product that we're selling is Beyond Meat. So we, you know, Beyond Meat is, is, is working on that whole supply chain for us. <laughs> um, and then we're buying it from them. But there were no, there were no issues around that that, um, arose over the pandemic for us at Planet Burger. Okay, wonderful. And, and same thing in your experience, Chris? Uh, so soy is in, a, is in a bit of a crunch at the moment. So if you're a big company, you'll, you'll, you'll feel it. And so, you know, Julie might not feel it, but Beyond Meat probably is. Uh, right now, soy is in demand. Oddly enough, truckers went in demand. When the, when the gas crisis hit, the truckers that were driving boxes around got paid three times the amount for driving uh, tankers around. So they were all of a sudden you couldn't get anything moved. So logistics is a really big issue. Supply chain is a really big issue. And uh, as you grow, that supply chain becomes more and more um, problematic, particularly as you're going over borders. Uh, we try to make sure that we have strategic investors on our cap tables for this exact reason. We have some of the largest, you know, agribusinesses in our supply chain, uh, like Louis Dreyfus, 150 year old company out of the Netherlands. Uh, they move, they move soy, you know, they know how to move ingredients. So we like to have those expertise around us just to make sure that supply chain isn't too big of an issue. Beautiful. And let, let's, uh, let's also go back and remind everyone that, you know, a plant-based burger is made uh, in the case of Beyond Meat with pea protein isolate mostly. So you grow the peas, you work on the peas, you produce the burger, you can do it all in the same place. And when you're uh, producing meat the traditional way through animals, which is done in factories nowadays, you have to grow animals, feed them. So you have to bring all the feed to them and make them grow. Then you bring them somewhere else and you kill them and then slaughter them. Then you have to bring them somewhere else and sell them uh, and you make them in pieces and package them. It's the complexity of that food system is such that there's no... Uh, uh, nothing could be more complex, as we saw during uh, the biggest crisis in COVID, when meat plants were shutting down uh, because of the hygienic and, 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 and horrible labor conditions, but also the fact that the entire uh, supply chain and distribution chain can fall apart in a few seconds because it's too complex and too expensive. And uh, we have a lot of, of, of questions from, from our audience. Uh, Chris, the, out of the things that you mentioned that customers care about, uh, can you rank them, please? 
So we start with taste, but like I said, taste is to, driven by hunger. Uh, so um, if you're in the process of starving, then odds are you know, your taste matters less. But we focus on taste because if you solve taste, the other things will start falling into place. We have a lot of elasticity around things like price. If I'm on a 13 hour flight to Hong Kong and a Beyond Burger is available, I'd pay $100 for that. So price isn't the issue for me, but convenience is, it won't be there. So I'll end up eating Fritos because that's what will come down the aisle, even though I want a Beyond Burger. So convenience is a really, really, really big driver. And people ignore that all the time. Uh, you have to get these things where people want them. Because remember, you're not ordering a Tesla or putting solar panels on your roof. You're trying to grab something for lunch and it's pretty simple. And so the convenience ends up being one of the biggest drivers for us, but everything else has to fall in place for convenience to work. Taste has to work. Price has to work. Awareness has to work. Do I even know where to buy this product? All four of those, there's an efficiency in there. The problem is the efficiency is different for every single human being. And I can't answer that for you. You can answer it for yourself, but we have to work within that to try to create as close as we can to hit as many people in that efficiency, in that efficiency equation, if you will. Okay. And Julie, um, Paula is asking, uh, she says she's enthusiastic about the realities we're describing, uh, but she says we need the change now. And she says, I think that social recognition and acceptance is key to spread the awareness. How? What would you suggest, Julie? So acceptance of plant-based foods, I assume she's asking? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Acceptance of alternatives. Yeah, well, I mean, I do think the pandemic helped the plant-based movement. I mean, I think that's helped it a little bit. It's going to take some time. I mean, people, um, yeah, I mean, that part of our grants program is spreading the awareness. I mean, we don't have, you know, we're not the Gates Foundation. <laughs> not, we don't have that kind of funding to, to spread it as broadly as others might be able to. But I think it's a, it's a process. Um, you know, Chris mentioned Seaspiracy. You know, that was, you know, for, I mean, I don't eat fish, but like that was eye opening for me, right? And, and, and um, there's a, you know, a steady drumbeat of, 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 of the things like Seaspiracy, game changers, things like that. And I just think it's going to take time. I mean, change is slow, but the, the animal industry was exposed pretty. Um, in a pretty naked way, I think, during the pandemic. And I think that's helped. But, you know, what Chris keeps going back to and what Christy does too, is it's like, you got to have that, the price, awareness, convenient, and taste. And, and once you have all those, I mean, I have so many friends who are just like, who will try to be vegan during Lent or something like that. And they'll be like, oh my gosh, thank, I love the Beyond Sausage. So, so much of it is just creating products that are delicious for people for the foods that they already know. And people will still, of course, eat tofu or lentils and those sorts of things that, you know, are also good. But if you're talking about reaching and democratizing plant-based food, you've got to go there. As, as Chris says, taste has got to be number one. And if and that will destigmatize the whole thing because people will say, this is just as delicious. And so um, it's a process and, you know, we're working at it through serving the food but also through through the grants program and it's just it's going to take time and we're, we're aided by things like seaspiracy and these other things that help raise the awareness of the issues hey sebastian I, i'd add to that that um our our thesis is global adoption comes through local acceptance and local acceptance local form flavor function and familiarity uh, if you're in New England, your clam chowder is different than than the one you're drink, than the, the one you're eating in New York, right? And in, and in Philadelphia, we don't eat soft shelled crabs, but go 45 minutes south or an hour south to Baltimore, and it's on the it's on the menu. We change our cuisine about um, pretty substantially every 200 kilometers all around the globe. So we have to still, even if I got a, a burger, it still has to be localized, and so that protein can still be the same. But that finished form has to be something that that people want to eat. And if they have a if they have a, a particular dish that they want, we need to be able to give it to them in that way. So give them the tools that they need to create something that's familiar to them. And and that goes all around the globe. You can't ask somebody in, in Japan to eat an, a, a New England crab cake. They won't know what it is. They, they don't eat that. So we have to be able to work with those local cultures. So to be able to, to take an American food and shove it in everybody's mouth around the globe is not the strategy to build a core protein and allow them to localize it, that, that one will work, but it still ends up being uh, culinary arts that finish the day on that. 
Yeah, I, I, let me let me be a little cynical about that, though. And uh, all around the world, there are McDonald's and, and Burger King that serve exactly the same junk food to everyone around the planet. So that's also something that needs to be addressed and hopefully from the quality standpoint, but also from where the ingredients come. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, I think all can be changed. Again, yeah. I, I'm on the cynical side. So what I think is that um, awareness is important. And, and of course, we need to work towards that. But what's really going to make a change is when the price of ingredients and finished products is lower than the animal alternatives, then you bet that the biggest food companies are going to start selling more of those just because they make more money. And this is, this is how it's going to go. So again, you know, the role of, of technology in, in making these foods healthier and more approachable from, from the price point is fundamental. Uh, let's, let's not forget that, um, the, the way the ingredients are processed and uh, and the efficiency with which these foods are produced have great impact on their price and availability. And so again, it's it's another engineering problem uh, that that uh, needs to be solved. Um, and um, uh, Christy, the um, what is next for Rebellious? Because you've 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 done and solved the chicken nuggets. So what's the next goal if you can share? I'm not sure that we've necessarily done and, and solved the chicken nuggets because just like Chris said, um, we too believe that all, all consumption is local. Um, we believe that a wide variety of products are necessary, even just in the chicken nugget market. Um, shape, size, flavor, weight, all sorts of things make a big difference between the school lunch program and your local quick service restaurant. Um, those are very different products. And um, as a result, adaptability is the name of the game when it comes to being a manufacturing technology company. Um, so what's next for us is we are deploying a brand new uh, production system called the Mach 1. Uh, we named it the Mach 1 because um, it's spelled M-O-C-K. So it makes mock meat, but it goes really, really fast. And so it's kind of like a fast plant-based meat production tool. Um, we're going to deploy that here in our facility. We're looking at deploying it in other facilities, but the holy grail of what we do at Rebellious is work with chicken processing facilities who want to convert their facilities to plant-based meat production facilities. And that's really key when we're talking about changing the infrastructure of the meat industry to a conversion of, into plant-based. You know, we know that we can continue to build more and more plant-based meat facilities, but nothing is gonna be quite as effective than going in and saying, you remove these three pieces of equipment, put in the Mach 1 or the Mach 2 or the Mach 3 that we've got here in our facility, and that converts that facility into a much more prosperous plant-based meat production facility, thereby making the chicken company more money, but converting their, their essentially their bottom line to plant-based. So that's what's really on the horizon for us is continuing to support that infrastructure transformation within the chicken industry. Fantastic. And, and Julie, what, what is next for Planet Burger and what is next? I did, you, you, you come up with a new project every few months. I can't keep up, but what is next? What can you, what can you tell us that is coming? Yeah, well, I, I um, just speak to what Chris said about uh, taste being local. We have a chili, uh, Philly cheesesteak in Philadelphia and our two stores there. And so, we, um, and so that was one of our newer things that we rolled out. Um, and, and so, you know, one of the, one of the people had asked about, um, coming to Boston. So for what's next for us is expansion, um, is continuing to expand within Whole Foods, but also getting out on the street and continuing to serve delicious food at a good price point. And again, is these price points, you know, when Beyond's price point comes down, then ours can come down. But we've been intentional about having a lower price point than some of the other plant-based restaurants um, that are kind of fast casual or fast food, because we do want it to be accessible for people and affordable for people. And so we look forward to being able to bring our prices down even for, further moving forward and serving more people. Um, you know, we're really on the East Coast around the DC area right now, but um, coming to Boston as soon as possible. And so growth and- um, And that, that was my next question. Can you, can you tell us wh which cities you're gonna hit next or is it a secret? Well, we're definitely looking at Boston and looking at New York. You know, we want to, we're still a pretty, Planet Burger is still a pretty small company and just in DC and two stores um, in the Philadelphia area. And, you know, growth makes sense for us to kind of keep it localized probably on the East Coast initially. Um, okay. And so, 
you know, we'll see. It'll be really exciting to. Um, to and, and so no international plans yet? Not for Planet Burger, not yet. But, you know, give us another six months. <laughs> Bet. And, and, uh, and Christy, another uh, very selfish question from, from myself. Uh, when are you going to start distributing in Europe? Oh, in Europe? Um, we don't, we're, we've been focusing on South America. <laughs> so we're not quite to Europe yet. Um, we also have a- That's sorry? not fair. That's sorry? That's not fair. You have to think of Europe. I mean, we got Europe. a wonderful investor from South America that's been uh, guiding our pathway down down south. So um, we'll we'll consider you and I should chat. We'll talk about Europe next, but right now we're focused on South America. <laughs> wonderful. And and Chris, you you know I've been asking you desperately for years now. So when when are your European plans kicking off? Give me a date when Good Catch will be available in Europe. Starting um, in Europe, yeah. So Good Catch is all over Europe. We have a, a two distributors there, mostly up in the northern part of the of the continent. Um, okay, wait, it's not all over Europe. We can't find it. So the, the, let's when, get there. I am. I'm working on it. Europe for We're real. Here. There's big quantities. I don't know. It's not in. It's not in Switzerland yet, but it's it's heading all over uh, the Netherlands at the moment, and uh, a shipping container is just going out right now. So. It's, it's getting closer. It's getting closer, and that's our and that's a part of our breaded line too. The breaded line is really, really good. Um, we just got our first shipment last night. But most importantly, the product migration brand, like what's coming, will blow your mind. And we're we're a year away from some products that will will change the way we think of not just seafood but all sorts of plant based meat. It's a really exciting time to be in the space. It's the engine engineers and scientists that are making it happen. And then it's the other people, the salespeople and the channel experts and the merchandisers that are going to put it into our mouths. And it's, it's, it's going to be a great next decade ahead of us. Beautiful. And we can't wait to, to see and taste and, and, and have your products available worldwide. And, uh, and of course, uh, you know, Julie, we're counting on you to expand internationally as soon as possible. So please make it a priority. <laughs> yeah. uh, but you know what, what's interesting with, with um, there are uh, a few brands and, and, and Chris knows very well being on the board of one of the most active companies in the space that, that is ent internationalizing everything. But it seems like, and I'm talking about Live Kindly, seems like that uh, having, uh, you know, they have a South African brand that they're now going to distribute worldwide. There's a Swedish brand that is distributed now all over Europe and it's coming to the US and so forth. It's amazing how successful uh, a local idea, going back to the idea of localizing food, a local idea can become for the rest of the world. I, I find it extremely interesting that, uh, you know, Oomph, for instance, is making these fantastic uh, plant-based meatballs that everybody loves all over the world. Of course, they're based, you know, they started in Sweden, uh, the, 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 you know, the birth country of, of this kind of meatballs. But guess what? The entire world loves them. So I can't wait to see your products and your ideas spread around the world. My, uh, Kirsty and I landed in Bangkok to meet some, some, some a, a company there. And we were all excited because we, we wanted Thai food. We were really excited about it. And we got a phone call and said, great news. I'm going to take you to this Mexican restaurant. They do excellent Mexican here. And I just, <laughs> just came all the way around the globe. I'm being fed Mexican food. But the fact is, of course, we can cross over boundaries. Of course, there's all sorts of opportunities is there. They all fit. At the end of the day, you still got to, you got to satisfy kind of the local consumer. And so again, everybody wins if you have fun with food. If you stick with the same thing over and over again, life's a little boring. So I'm hoping that we can bring some flavor to this. Destigmatize the idea that all we eat is, is tree bark and grass clippings. We don't. We eat really, really good food. The, best food I've ever eaten came after I became vegan, not before. So we're in a, we're in a really great world of exploration. It's a very, very exciting place to be. It's a very exciting place to invest too. Fantastic. Well, I, I think this is a perfect uh, ending to our conversation, Chris. Thank you for that. Thank you, Julie, for being with us. I, I can't wait to hear more about everything that you're doing and, and let's keep the conversation going on how uh, Eat the Change and the Plan Shift Initiative at Northeastern can interact because I think it would be a great synergy. And, and Christy, um, we'll make sure the university makes um, rebellious information available, but of course they can, I, I suppose they can find your website very easily. 
because you're hiring and you'll keep hiring because you're going to grow to be the biggest company in the world. We hope so. That's, you know, that there's going to be a lot of room for engineers and they will be well understood. And, and Chris, uh, can't keep up with everything you're doing, but I'm trying, but, uh, we should catch up and, 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 and so that I know what's coming next, which is always the case, uh, because you're always five years ahead of everyone. So I can't wait to hear what the future, the future holds. Me too. And uh, so thank you. Thank you very much for being with us today. And uh, hopefully this conversation has in inspired the students and everyone else as much as it has me. Thank you thank so you much. for having us. This is a this is really fun to, to talk with everybody and uh, happy to come back anytime. Awesome. Thank you so much thank for having you. me. Stay on for a few seconds, okay? Thank you all for joining us today for the Plant Shift Initiative Speaker Series. The event recording will be posted on the Northeastern University Alumni YouTube channel. A link to the recording will also be shared in the email that will be sent within the next two to three business days. That will include a short survey. Thank you again. We look forward to your feedback.